Hello everyone, Mike is back here with uh, another chess video. I would like to show you one of my recent games. In fact, a game I played just two days ago at the Las Vegas Chess Center. This was round one of a local tournament. Uh, and uh, I played against uh, a kid who I believe is like 11 or 12 years old. He just crossed 1700. Uh, and uh, there is a big difference in rating between us. I'm about 600 points higher. And... Uh, I honestly could not um, focus on the game and bring my best effort and this is an example of how one can get in trouble when um, one doesn't take opponent seriously, what we can learn from it. Um, <clears throat> so I want to show you the game and focus on the key moments. I was black, uh, my opponent played d4 and I played d6, d4, knight f6, uh, knight c3, e5, I played this opening more than any other opening against d4, it's modern Philidor. Um, what I like about it is um, <clears throat> it leads to a lot of um, complicated positions where it's hard, it, in most lines, it's hard for white to simplify. Uh, black is a little worse uh, if white plays objectively, but it's quite playable. Uh, so a lot of my low-rated low rated opponents like uh, going through this line where they trade queens and they just think they can make a draw. Uh, it's quite a boring position uh, because uh, it's just like not much going on. So I, I really, anytime my opponents do that, uh, I'm like, oh, again. Uh, but um, yeah, so bishop g5 um, is one of the main moves for white. Bishop e6, white castles with check, knight bd7. Knight goes to f3, so now white is threatening to capture this pawn on e5. So I have to unpin my knight, so I do this by playing king c8. So I had this position uh, many times as black. And according to my database uh, in chess base, white only scores about 31% here. So it's not the greatest line for white. Uh, primary reason is this knight on c3 is very passive. It doesn't have a lot of things to do. Uh, the pawn structure is very symmetrical, and in a lot of the situations, basically, it comes down to the fact that white has really no targets and, and black does, and black can a lot of times be able to outplay white. Uh, I have a lot of draws in this position, uh, in, in this line. Um, my highlight is beating uh, an FM from Mexico, who was like 2300 feet there. Uh, there are some low lights too, and uh, one of the low lights... Uh, is the fact that position often ends up uh, equal and kind of like boring and sometimes I try to win against low rated opponents in force of action. Sometimes I win, sometimes I end up losing. Um, anyways, so let's continue with the game. Uh, so the opponent plays bishop e2, uh, I played c6. So this move restricts the knight and prepares b5 possibly. A3, so the opponent uh, tries to prevent bishop b4. Uh, bishop b4, the idea would be to capture a knight and take the e pawn. So right here, I should probably go for b5 to expand on the queen side and possibly prepare moving my king to b7. Um, but what I played is also okay. Bishop c5, attacking his f pawn. Bishop h4. And, and right here, I played a very standard maneuver in this position. I played knight g4, attacking the f pawn, forcing uh, rook f1. And basically what I'm going for is this um, um, reorganization uh, of my pieces. I play f6, and this knight ends up heading to f7, uh, heading to d6, possibly joining the action on the queen side. Uh, knight can come to c4, possibly, but it's like knight f7, knight d6. This knight goes to b6, then they can combine together on c4. So there's a lot of possibilities here for black. As you see... <coughs> Uh, opponent plays knight a4, attacking my bishop, bishop retreats to e7. I thought he was he played knight a4 move with an idea of follow through with c4, but he kind of surprised me with the next move, he played knight e1. So he's relocating this knight on d3, is it better there, I'm not sure. He can, re he can never really get a 4 in because I'll simply take and he cannot recapture back because of g5 fork. Anyway, so here I played b5, very natural move, kicking his knight back, played a5. And knight d3, <clears throat> and I play b4. So right, right here already, you can you can see that uh, I'm gradually. Uh, oh, hold on a second. Now I actually played g5 first. G5 first, kick his bishop back to stop any f4 activity. Yeah. 
played this first and then I played b4. So let's uh, stop here for a second. Um, so you see here, white's really passive. The, the bishop on g3 is awful. Uh, there is no f4. Uh, position is very locked up. Uh, and black is expanding on the queen side. I think maybe it was a little bit... I, I kind of like playing knight f7 um, first, maybe move my king before I start the action on the queen side, but the problem with this approach was I really didn't like to move bishop g4, and that forces a trade of light square bishops, gives him an open h file, and now suddenly he has some play. So um, I'm not sure where exactly I misplayed this, because I really do want to include move knight, knight f7 if I, if I can. But now it's kind of like, if I if I play knight f7, then light square bishops get traded, which I don't like. But if I don't play knight f7, then my knight's kind of stuck on the edge of the board. Uh, so I said, okay, you know, let the knight stand here for a bit. I will worry about him later on, play b4. And here, clearly, white needs to play knight b1. Really, no need to... A, b, a, b, this inclusion of this trade really is beneficial for black, because it opens up the rook and uh, allows black to create some possible threats in the, in the a file. So right here I'm better, now up to this point I think I played really well. Um, not better by much, but better by a little bit. Uh, I have more space, I have better pieces, I have open A file. But right here I think I needed to uh, consolidate first, bring my pieces into the game. Uh, I need to connect my rooks, uh, get my king off the 8th rank, so probably king c7 uh, was the best course of action. What I played is like 2... Ambitious, rook a1, uh, not the best move, although, although it doesn't spoil anything yet. He plays b3, and here I decided to connect my rooks in case he plays king b2 next. I want, to, I want to be able to connect my rooks and defend my other rook, and I played king to b7. I think, in retrospect, going king c7 was, was a better move um, for two reasons. Number one is my king uh, is not getting in the way of the possible fork on c5. Um, and it will be easier for me to guard my uh, b-pawn if I need to by playing rook b8. And also my pieces are staying um, compact um, as a group here. I was a little bit concerned about my king standing on the same diagonal as his bishop. So uh, that's why I chose king b7. It's a little bit inaccurate. And uh, now he goes knight b2. And uh, here is an interesting moment. So I was trying to decide what to do. And I really was looking at two moves, knight c5 and knight b6. And knight c5 attacks the pawn, let's say he goes f3. Now there is a very interesting piece sacrifice. Bishop takes b3, takes, check. He must play uh, king c2, now knight d4, check. And here it turns out he must go to, he must he must uh, capture my, my knight. If he goes uh, king d2, I, I simply recover my piece by playing rook a2 and he has no way to guard the b knight, the b2 knight. Uh, so, I could not really correctly evaluate this position. The material is about level. Um, we do have this knight in h6 who is not in the game uh, at the moment. And the bishop is bad. So, against a low-rated opponent, I didn't want to force the action uh, and go for something complicated like this. Now, this is where um, kind of the attitude of not taking your opponent seriously starts to show. I'll just play normal moves and he will fall apart somehow. So that was my attitude and that kind of came to bite me later in the game. So knight b6, uh, this is more like a defensive move, stops knight a4, knight c4. He goes f3, so he's clearly trying to get this bishop on f2 and uh, trade his bishop for my knight. So I play bishop c5, uh, threatening bishop e3 check, so he goes bishop f2. Now we trade it um, here, and um, right, right here, I kind of really underestimated his chances, still thinking I'm better, but my advantage kind of dissipated a little bit, um, because, uh, you know, the more pieces you trade, the less important the space advantage becomes, and I do have a space advantage in the queen side, but he does have some nice squares for his pieces, like the c4 square, my knight on h6 is pretty bad as well. So I did play knight f7 like almost instantly, which looks like a very normal move, but I completely overlooked that knight d3 just wins a pawn on b4, and now it's a whole different ball game. What I should have done is to play rook c8 in order to be able to meet knight d3 with c5. It's probably equal position. Uh, then I can relocate my knight to f7 and d6, um, and, and so on. 
Uh, but this Knight of Seven move is where things started going wrong for me. And now he just goes Knight D3, and I'm like, whoa, I can't. I have no way to guard my pawn. Um, now I realized that I might be, um, might be, might be in full on day. Might be uh, tough to fight to get a draw here. So uh, here, like here, was the first time in the game where I actually started thinking. Uh, for a while, and what did I do here? I played 97. Um, my engine recommends retreating the rook to a5 and then playing c5 after he captures, and then trading the bishop in order to be able to blockade his passed pawn with my knight. So, right here, I'm down a pawn, but I probably have about half a pawn of compensation due to the fact his bishop is really bad and I'm able to block his passed pawn. But here, uh, it's just passive suffering, really. Like, I can probably make a draw, especially against somebody who is much lower rated. But it will be next to impossible to win. So, I played knight d7. He took the pawn, played king c7, trying to consolidate my pieces. If I were him, I would just, like, see what happens. Like, check and come back. Um, see see what, what a higher, higher rated opponent what to do. I would have to repeat and take a draw, really, I have no other choice. Um, but he instead just started doing something mm, a bit uh, odd, because I think his knight is pretty good on before, but instead he, he ends up he ends up going um, ends up going back to d3. I'm not sure why, played knight d6, and now he goes knight b2. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> right, right, right here, uh, right here I had an interesting move. I could play uh, play knight d6, but in, in a game, uh, play knight d6, knight d6, knight b2. R right here, I had an interesting move. I could play rook b8. And the idea is, if he ends up going knight a4, we'll play c5 and try to undermine by playing c4. For example, I have the following line analyzed. Knight here, c4, bishop takes... Uh, Knight takes, pawn takes, bishop takes. And here, white's still down a pawn, but black has a very, very active position. Rooks are extremely active. It's kind of hard for white to um, kind of untie himself. So this is probably equal, despite of black being down a pawn. However, I played knight c5, uh, possibly thinking about sacrificing on e4 and then realizing that uh, sacrifice doesn't work because take, take. Uh, he always has rook f3, which guards from knight c3, so that doesn't seem to work anyway. So he goes knight d3, so he's kind of hesitant, moves knight back and forth. And uh, again, if this was like a opponent of about same strength, I would probably just repeat and take a draw. But here I'm playing somebody much lower rated than me, so uh, objectively the move I made is not the best. But practically trying to spice things up and muddy the water, so to speak. So I played knight to a4. And the idea was if he takes, I'm going to bring my rook to b8. And if knight b2, I'm going to play bishop a2. So I'm recovering my piece back, complicating the situation. It's also easier probably to recover the a pawn than, 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 than to recover my missing pawn when his pawns are connected. So he doesn't fall for it. He doesn't take the knight. He plays king d2, saying, what are you going to do? And I played rook b8 anyway, and now he goes uh, rook f1. Not a, not a bad not a bad move. It's a good move. Uh, also very strong was to just play rook uh, knight c3. And if I take take with the knight, just basically here he has an extra pawn for no compensation whatsoever. Really good winning chances. Uh, but what he did was also fine. He goes rook f1, and here okay my knight is hanging. Um, the only square I can go to is knight b6. That gives up a really nice outpost for him on c5. And I have no compensation for the pawn whatsoever. After knight c3, he can trade rooks. And I'm just going to either lose or I'll be lucky to make a draw here. So I'm like, okay, uh, I'm not going to win a play knight b6. So I, again, made a move which is objectively bad, uh, but practically a good choice because it complicates things and forces my opponent to find the right moves. And if he doesn't find all the best moves, uh, we will have a chance, and that's exactly what happened. So I think this is a really good learning moment um, 
kind of like playing practical chess. Against the engine, yeah, this, this never works. But practically, uh, if he sacrificed on b3, took on b3, I kind of wanted to play rook a2, but figured out that it doesn't work after king e1, rook takes b3. He has this, he has this amazing move knight c1, just forks both of my rooks, and I, I just lost. So I had to take on b3 first. And, and this position is completely winning for white, completely winning. But he has to find um, a right move, which is not, not that hard. He just has to play knight c3. Um, because when you're defending, uh, one of the really good techniques to defend is to just trade pieces. Uh, take away the attacking power from your opponent. So if I take, he will take, and I have nothing really probably dead lost. But luckily for me, he doesn't play this move, and he plays king to e3, which is already a major inaccuracy. It brings me back into the game. So now playing knight b2, and uh, attacking his d-rook, and attacking this pinned knight. He plays rook c1, and right here, uh, objectively best move per engine is rook a2, and the line that my engine gives is the following. White plays rook d2. Uh, now black can recover a little bit of material after sacrificing an exchange, take rook a3. At the moment I'm down a rook, but I'm getting this um, bishop. And if white finds the best move, knight b1, uh, knight, knight b1, knight takes b3, oh no, sorry, better play rook c2 first, rook c2 first, forcing me to take with the knight, knight b1. Rook b3, rook c3. And, and going into this line, uh, all black can hope for is a draw. Black down exchange for a pawn. So there are, there are drawing chances for sure, but black can forget about winning. That was the best, objectively best move. But I played f5, which is also a reasonable move. I'm trying to get every possible piece involved into the game. And here my opponent finally blundered really badly. <clears throat> so his best move here was knight to c3. Again, the idea is, is the same everywhere. Simplify, trade pieces, um, f4 check, for example, king f2. Let's say knight takes d3 check, bishop takes d3. We can play rook a a3. Kind of interesting, interesting pin here. Bishop e2. And no, no, sorry. Knight, knight b1, knight b1, knight b1. This escape move, rook a2, bishop e2, knight b5. Knight comes to d4. So there is some play, but I think eventually, after something like the rook f e1, knight d4, king f1, rook b2, knight c3. Yeah, it's not super easy to find all these moves for white. But if white does find all the moves, he will eventually be able to untie his pieces and win eventually due to the extra piece. So that was his best option, knight c3. But luckily for me, he plays rook c3, and that is a huge blunder. Uh, so immediately here, black is at least equal. So here I spend a lot of time trying to decide which move was better, rook takes b1 or f4 check. And at first, uh, f4 check looked winning for me. Let's say he goes here, knight takes d3, bishop takes d3, uh, I have a cool move, rook takes b1, and if he takes on b1, I take on c3. Uh, I did overlook this resource. So it's not so easy. Here black is better, because when all the pawns on one flank, uh, knight dominates a bishop, and all the pawns on light squares. Uh, can I win? I'm not sure, but definitely at least equal. Uh, and then... Uh, king d2 is just really crazy line. I, I didn't see anything there for me after king d2. Uh, so here, pro I, I saw this check, king c2. My rook has to move somewhere, probably b5 or something like that, or b6, I'm not sure. And I looked at this line with the engine after checking here, knight b5. I don't know what's going on here, to be honest. Engine shows equal, despite of black being down a piece, a really tricky position. Um, so so it's a good uh, practical advice when you don't see variation till the end, just don't play it, go for the simpler, more simple line. And rook takes b1 is clearly a more simple line. White has to make a decision which rook to take. I think it's better to take the b3 rook and keep that rook on f1 because it allows the king to hide behind the rook on g1, for example. 
a little bit of an accuracy here by my opponent. Rook takes b1, I check, king f2, and uh, yeah, king f2, and rook takes c3. That's a position we got, and after he took here, we managed to equalize the material, and let's be honest, our position should be preferable because his bishop is bad, his bishop is locked up by all his pawns, our knights are dominating, and we have a really cool resource, which I immediately executed. This move e4 puts him under pressure right away. Uh, his best move probably was to take and to play king e1, but even here I'm better. Uh, I like my chances here. My knights are more active, I have a passed pawn. Uh, but he did not do that. He played knight c5. Check. Now this pawn uh, becomes quite dangerous. King e1. And right here I played knight to d2. <clears throat> this is a double attack. I'm attacking his rook and his knight. Luckily for him he has a bailout move. Knight e6 check. King d7. And now he moves his uh, rook away. And here I played knight takes f5. Knight takes g5, and we got this position here. And right here, I I felt really good about my position due to my passed pawn on e3 and my knights dominating. And I got a little bit reckless here, and I, and I misunderstood the most important point in this position. Uh, so, and it's very, very subtle, so I want to pause here. It's very likely that white will be able to force trade one of the knights. And if that happens, the trade we want is black is knight for knight trade. We want to leave white with that really bad bishop. So for that to happen, we need to play h6. And that forces white either to play knight e4, um, which is like a horrible trade for him. And after knight d4, we have rook c2, c5 if needed to support this knight. And we're just going to play uh, e2 at some point and just break through. And that's winning completely. h6 is winning. Or after h6, if he doesn't go knight e4, he has to play something like knight f7. His knight ends up being completely out of the game. What I played was knight d4, and that's a mistake. Uh, black is still better, uh, but white, if white just played like a normal solid move, bishop d1, as passive as it looks, it's not straightforward to win. I looked at it a little bit. For example, uh, the line engine uh, recommends here is to play knight from d2 to b3, and the difference here, like I already mentioned, is the fact that we did not get the trade that we wanted he, he managed to get rid of his uh, terrible bishop here. And in this position, black is probably better, but it might not be enough to win. If white uh, plays uh, optimally, he might be able to hold due to the nature of material uh, being kind of reduced here. Well, again here, um, my opponent was getting a little bit low on time. Not too low, but probably under 20 minutes for the rest of the game with a 30 second increment. And that was gaming 90 plus 30 time control, by the way. And he makes... Uh, I move very quickly, and it's a horrible move. Rook a7 just loses the game on the spot. King d6. He has no time to um, to take this pawn because of rook c1 and e2. So he goes knight e4 check. Uh, that is also a really bad move. Um, white is lost here no matter what he does. But, for example, if he plays the best move, something like king d1, uh, we can play rook b3, threatening mate on b1. And then, for example, rook a1 to guard the mate, rook b2. We're gradually invading on the second rank. And uh, here, like, there's a really, really nice move, knight c4 here. Uh, and white cannot take because of rook d2 and then either knight b3 or knight c2 winning the exchange. And in this line, white will end up losing a lot of material. Like rook d2 being threatened here. So, for example, if... Um, if he moves king e1 to stop rook e2, I can simply take on g2 and completely dominate him here. The h pawn is completely irrelevant and winning. But what he played uh, made things much easier. He play, played knight e4 check uh, right here after king d6. Knight e4 check. I just took the knight and now rook c1 check. Only move bishop d1 and now e2. Just decides the game. This e pawn just ran through and... Um, he can't he can't stop me from promoting. He tried e5 check. It really doesn't matter what I do here. I played king e6 and he immediately resigned. But even if I do play king takes e5, uh, this is still completely losing. Even if he manages 
to do this just easy easy win um, so pr pretty interesting game uh, shows that uh, sometimes um, you know underestimating your opponent can really backfire and also shows some practical choices that one has to make uh, like sometimes you have to take risks basically and uh, just like sacrificing this piece it could have totally backfired could have could have led to a lost game uh, but practically knowing I'm playing somebody who is low rated uh, and complicating the position taking chances uh, can also lead to good results occasionally so hopefully you guys enjoyed this game and till later signing off